bargain and sale deed has one implication. And if you look on uh, page 89, it's where they talk about it. There are no express warranties. Express means disclosed or known. There are no warranties to it at all. It is an implication that we own the property because we took it through a legal court case and now we've got it. All right. That would be the third bullet point. The fourth bullet point, I, Raymond Modulin, remise, release, and quit claim. All right. I told you before, I number my pet peeves, and here is probably number one. It is not a quick claim. All right. The word is, let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger. Quit claim. It is a quit claim deed, meaning I quit. A quit claim deed, believe it or not, is even lower. A quit claim merely transfers my interest in the property, whatever it is, to the grantee. So it serves as no warranties at all. If that's the case, why even have it? A quit claim serves a very valuable purpose. It does happen quickly, but it's named a quit claim because I am surrendering my interest in the property. So if I ask you guys, do you want to buy my property at 13th and LaSalle? I will quit claim it to you right now for $10,000. It's got a rental income, all of that. And your answer to me would probably be, Lashana, you do it? Got a checkbook? I'll send it to you now. The answer is no, because you don't know my interest. Maybe I'm lying to you. Maybe I'm not lying to you, but the HOAs do. I'm two months behind on the house payment. I haven't paid taxes in two years. Guess what? All of that would now be yours because I'm transferring my interest. I'm like, sucker, and walk away, all right? So you don't typically use a quick claim between parties that don't know what's going on. What a quick claim works great for is when there is a transfer of real property between people that know the other person's interest. The most common time you would see it is when a husband and wife get divorced. One party will quit claim their interest to the other party because the other party was probably with them when they bought the house and they know their husband's interest is a general warranty deed because we were married when we bought the house. So if the husband quit claims his interest to the wife, she knows what she's getting. Partners, family members, divorcing spouses, people that understand or know the interest, this is a great tool to quickly transfer interest but it's called a quit claim, all right? And they talk about it on the bottom of, or in the middle there of page 90. Now understand that there's no difference in the conveyance of the property during these three. Still a grantor signing it, still a, names a grantee, all of the things we're talking about would still be involved. It's just representing the difference in the level of protection that you're giving in this transfer, all right? The conveyance mechanism is the same. You still sign it, you'd still get it over because it's still voluntary, all right? So don't get caught up on that question in the quiz or the state exam. The conveyance mechanism, the method by which we do it is still the same process 
This is just explaining the difference in degrees of, of protection. The quit claim is also used to remove what they call a cloud on the title, all right? I don't need to do this, but I like playing. <laughs> a cloud, that actually looks like a guy. A cloud on the title is something that could pop Cause someone to stop and pause for a second. Maybe there's different names. Raymond Modulin versus Ray Modulin. That could be a cloud. Well, we could solve that by deeding it from Ray Modulin to Raymond Modulin. And then you would have this chain of unbroken stuff by using this quickly method of using a quit claim from one person to the other. It could also happen sometimes there is a way to use it for like females, maybe bought a property in a single name, now they're married, have different names. Or they were married, they've gone back to a single name. That's one way to do it. There's this other method we're not gonna talk about right now. All right, so go back to page 86 and realize that the granting clause is one of these four protection levels, general, special, bargain and sale, or quick claim. And the seller himself is the one that would decide which method he wants to choose. The next clause in the deed is called the Habendum Clause. The Habendum Clause explains the enjoyment that you are getting to have and to hold. That is the possession twig. Remember, you get the right to possess the property. Here's the clause that grants it. I'm giving you the property or selling you the property voluntarily, and I am allowing you to have and to hold it. So I'm granting you the possession in the Habendum Clause. It explains the degree of ownership. There is a habendum clause in the marriage vows. So go home to your spouse tonight and tell them you own them, all right? That marriage clause says to have and to hold. That is the possession. Try that. Hey, honey, I own you. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Don't do that. That would be wrong. There is a section in the clause or in the deed that explains where it is. This is the Northwest Quadrant of the Northwest Quadrant of the Northwest Quadrant. So they identify the property. We sell by legal description, not by address. We sell by legal description. That's why we went through that whole chapter the other day so that you understand what a legal description is. That whole thing, will be in the deed. It will not say 12 Smith Street. It'll say lot seven per Sherman Commons of plat book number seven, which is the Northwest Quadrant of the North, and it'll be four, five, six lines long because that is the description of the property we are conveying, not 432 South Emerson, because somebody's gonna go, oh, I thought I was buying the one in Indy. Well, you wouldn't if we're using the legal description, so that would be in the deed. Any exceptions or reservations? This is where all of the stuff that is exempted, and what I mean is I told you earlier that it says I will remove all of the encumbrances. This is the second step. And what I mean by that is in the general warranty deed, I'm giving you this blank carte blanche statement says, I will remove all of them. And then the exceptions, it's gonna say, except the power line easement, the shared driveway easement. This is where the second half of that is. You get what I'm saying? I first say, I'm gonna take them all away, except the power line, that's gonna survive the closing. The shared driveway, that's gonna survive the closing. That's where these exceptions would be for those encumbrances that you can't get rid of. So in the, we take them away, 
and then I put them back in and go, well, not these. Okay. Um, the signature of the grantor. The seller will actually sign the deed. The buyer does not. The seller then must have the deed acknowledged. Acknowledged. We call this a notary public. Notary public, not a notary public. I used to think that it's a republic. No, it's a notary. They are voluntarily have taken this position to be a uh, acknowledger, and what their job is to do is to verify that the person who is signing literally is the person they're claiming to be and that they're signing without duress. So when you get something notarized, remember they say, well, okay, bring the document in. It can't be signed. They want to actually watch you sign it because they want to make sure that you are not doing this under some threat or some duress where somebody's going, hey, sign that. So you would take the document if you were normal situation, like into your bank, the notary would come in and say, okay, come into the office, show me your ID. There, that's me. And they would look at it and go, okay, I confirm that it's Raymond Modulin. Now I want to watch you sign this document. And then they will acknowledge it that it is in fact Raymond Modulin and that he was doing it without any duress at all. That's hence the word voluntary alienation. When you go to the title company and we go to this closing, the title officer is a licensed notary. And if you've bought or sold a house recently, you know when you walk in, the very first thing they ask for is, I need your ID and your ID and your ID and your ID. I need the buyer's IDs, I need the seller's IDs, because I need to verify that you are who you say you are. And during the closing, I will watch you sign all of the documents and I will acknowledge it sitting at the table. So you're signing documents and they're all of a sudden now you see them signing and stamping because they're notarizing the fact, hey, that was Raymond doing it on his own volition. Now, here's the key thing. A acknowledgement has zero effect or concept on the legal document. It has nothing to do with that. They are not attorneys. They won't give you legal advice. They won't tell you to sign it or not to sign it. All they're doing is acknowledging. So theoretically, you could write a document that says pink elephants fly at midnight and get it notarized because all the notary is going to say, is, yep, Raymond, yep, he signed it. That has nothing to do with the legality of the document. All right. So that is what the acknowledgement does. So now we've got this voluntary deed. We've got it acknowledged. And then the seller reaches over and hands it to the buyer. And the buyer takes the deed. Boop. There goes the transfer. It happens upon delivery and acceptance of the deed. Once the buyer reaches up and takes the deed and has accepted the delivery, boop, Zelda's little diamond transfers, and now the buyer owns the property and has this magical thing called the title, which is proof of ownership, and the deed has served its purpose. Its sole purpose is to affect the transfer. Once the buyer receives it and the title has been transferred, literally that deed is of no value. It served its purpose. The example that I give, is some of you know that I'm a big cigar fan. When I strike a match, the fire's here. I transfer the fire to my cigar. The cigar fire's now at the cigar. What do I do with the match? It served its purpose. Literally, just throw it away. In theory, you could throw the deed away. It served its purpose. Now, we do record it as part of the document to show there was a transfer. 
but the deed literally does not prove ownership. It only merely shows there was a transfer of ownership on that date and that time. Two years later, you show the deed, someone's gonna go, big deal. You could have sold it since then. That just shows you took the ownership on that day. So once it does its job, it literally has served its purpose. Now the buyer wants to record it. And when we get to the closing chapter, there is this fee called the deed recording fee. The buyer is always, always obligated to pay that because he has the most interest in showing there was a transfer, okay? But the reality is as soon as it gets recepted, boom, done.